if we are hosting Antonio Felix and her hearing about her book, the book Fatal Remedy, uh, uh, it's off the uh, New York Times bestseller list. Uh, she's from Minneapolis. Uh, one is one fool at a time because we want to hear what's going on and uh, not be left out. Uh, and the other is uh, that we do not insult anybody here personally or no, we've never did it. Uh, <laughs> the management uh, does not like cleaning up. Uh, introduce our speaker, Ram. Any other announcements? Introduce our speaker. In that case, we will hear from our speaker, Antonia Felix. Antonia Felix. Thanks very much. Good evening, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. This is going to be so fun for me. I love talking about the story behind this book. I am. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a writer who lives up in Minneapolis, and I've been going around a few different places talking about my latest book, which is fiction. This is a medical thriller. I, in the past, I've mostly published nonfiction, and I've kind of made a, a niche in the political biography area. I've done several, published several political biographies. The latest one was the first biography about a Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. And yeah, it was, a, it was a wonderful project, and I'm honored to have been the first one to tell her her story. She came out with her autobiography about a year and a half ago, and I, I haven't had a chance to read that yet, but I'm sure it's great. But uh, so it's been a wonderful career writing about politics and um, movers and shakers in politics, especially women. I've learned a lot. I do some teaching, do some college teaching about public intellectuals, the scholars who take their work and um, make it accessible for the public, and they're activists and scholars, they're very important people in our, in our society. I love talking about that, it's kind of a treat, speaking truth to power kind of class with grad students, and it gets real exciting and, and uh, you know, controversial, we all, we all need that. I guess that's why you're all here, isn't that kind of what you're all about, this group? Speaking truth to power? Good. I love it. I love it. Thank you for having me. So, this book, I was so excited to write my first thriller. And I'll tell you, I, I think it's pretty interesting how this book came to be. I got a call. I had been wanting to write fiction, but you know, I was getting paid to write nonfiction, and I wasn't going to turn that kind of work down, but I kept thinking, man, it sure would be nice someday if uh, somebody would, would come up to me and say, I, here, let me write you a check. I want you to write this story because it's really important. <laughs> and lo and behold, one day my phone rings. Somebody I know, and, and uh, he said, I don't, know if you, I don't know if you're into this or not, but uh, I've got a good friend who's got a pretty amazing true story, and he doesn't want to write the true story because he doesn't want to get sued for libel. But he's looking for a novelist to turn it into fiction and kind of, you know, change the city, change some of the names, change a little bit of the stuff so that it can't be pointed back to the, uh, the bad guy in the book. Are you interested in doing that? And <laughs> I said, yeah, where do I sign? So that's how this book came to be. Fatal Remedy is based on fact. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. About 85% of what happens in this thriller is taken from actual testimony of people from their documents in, in um, state health board uh, files and things like that, and from a lot of conversations I had with people who have dealt with the plot line of this book. And it bases on the, the two main plot lines. The two main themes in this book are about two controversial issues. Number one, antidepressants and perhaps what we could call the over prescribing of and sale of antidepressants in this country especially how they're prescribed to children very hot button controversial issue in the medical field and secondly um, one aspect of psychiatry and some of the uh, criminal stuff that's happening with psychiatry just uh, in particular the, uh, the criminal sexual behavior that's happening and 
That is not to say that I'm somebody who slams psychiatry or slams therapy. I believe in those medical methodologies and very much especially therapy and you can't lump all psychiatrists all into one group or anything but because and you might not have known this psychiatrists are the most disciplined uh, practitioners in the medical field it's just that's what the uh, the statistics show in, over over the nation that um, not just for sexual, sexual misconduct, which in over 19 states in this country has been made a felony, um, but also for fraud, Medicare fraud and stuff like that. So for some reason, that particular field has um, practitioners that are disciplined the most uh, from year to year. I found that, among other facts, I just found that really interesting when I was doing a lot of research for this book. So those are the two main themes that, that run the plots of the book. And I want to talk to you about some of the research, some of the, the facts that I discovered I as I was working on this. Okay. So. Don't worry about it. You got a minute. We've all seen commercials on TV, heard them on the radio, about drugs for depression, right? And it's common knowledge. What is it that we're being told? Where, where does depression come from? What's wrong? What's happening in the body that causes depression? But even more basic than that. Low neurotransmitters. Society. An imbalance, a chemical imbalance, exactly. Isn't that pretty? And then we take a drug where the serotonin is going to have a, have a chance to do its job, right? Because there's an imbalance. That just that's our common knowledge of what we've been told. Well, guess what? That is not true. <laughs> Scientifically, that was a hypothesis that was never made credible. And it was presented way back in the 60s. Somebody made the hypothesis. They did a bunch of studies. And they thought, well, it was a hypothesis, but we could never prove it. So it's really, it, it's not true, but it's something that we were considering. This happens in science all the time. But later on, in the, uh, in the 80s, the pharmaceutical companies decided that that was a pretty no compelling thanks. idea. To this lady. And they came up with humongous marketing campaigns to give us this message that, hey, depression is caused by chemical imbalance, and we have the remedy for that. It was all a marketing ploy. And that almost sounds like I'm being a you know, conspiracy theorist or something like that. But this is proven these are the actual facts. We have been given a line. And as a result, pharmaceutical companies have become enormously successful. I'm going to tell you a little bit later about how many of us are actually taking these drugs. The sales are, are, are unbelievable. So the serotonin hypothesis is really a marketing ploy. There's no science behind it. So something that uh, was discredited decades and decades ago has now made, as I said, uh, products like Prozac, Wellbutrin, um, all of these antidepressants, very, very popular. What's really interesting next to that, another scientific fact that I was absolutely shocked to learn, is that these drugs only work maybe 2% better than placebo, which is not clinically re relevant. So placebo is a very powerful effect, right? Sugar pill, if you think you're getting something that's going to help you, the mind takes that, takes it over, and placebo effect's a very real thing. It's very powerful. But actually, the drugs themselves are have maybe a 20% chance of making you better, and they don't even know how that works. Uh, but most of it, 75% at least, of why some people get better on these medications, some people get some relief from their depression, is because of the placebo effect. Now, okay, what's, why, why would that be bad if somebody is going to get a little bit better? Who cares if it's a sugar pill or a, or a chemical compound? 
Well, there are risk factors with any drug, and also you're paying for it. So those are two big reasons. Third, huge reason, do you really want to be giving that to a child for 10 years no. when their brain isn't, no. going, isn't going to be fully mature until no. they're about 21, 22 years old? No, no long-term studies on kids. It's a very risky proposition. So some people would say the side effects aren't worth it. It took parents being very outraged and very concerned about their kids being on antidepressants and getting aggressive, anxious, turning into different kids, wanting to commit suicide or actually committing suicide to insist that the FDA look at these studies more. And finally, finally in 2004, the FDA put a black box warning on antidepressants saying these drugs caused cause suicidal thoughts in kids and adolescents. That's how uh, risky these drugs are. But the FDA wasn't going to do that on its own. It took a lot of outrage to make that happen. So things can change. If you speak up, as you know, things can actually change, important things. So again, these side effects, right on the, you know, right in the packaging, these drugs are associated with anxiety, agitation, panic attacks, insomnia, irritability, hostility, severe restlessness, and mania. And a common side effect is, is something called akathisia, which is extreme restlessness and compulsions, compul the compulsion to commit violence to others or to yourself. I think that's a pretty big risk. If, um, if the chances of the drug working are so slim compared to placebo, I think that's a, a pretty big risk. I was really surprised to find out about all of this. Many, many studies have proven this to be true, that these drugs just aren't effective and the side effects are too risky. So, those are some of the side effects that I just mentioned. But, um, in spite of the fact that kids are especially vulnerable to the side effects of these drugs, and the fact that the, the, uh, the FDA does not approve all of them to be prescribed to kids, the drug companies are still telling doctors that they should prescribe them to kids. Now, this is where the criminal behavior comes in. In 2012, GlaxoSmithKline settled with the U.S. government for the biggest criminal health-related uh, case in the history of this country. They paid the government $3 billion over for fines because they had illegally marketed antidepressants to kids and done some uh, lying in medical research that they published and other illegal acts. Um, a little bit before that, Pfizer had settled for $2.3 billion. So you know that the profits that these companies are making are so big that $3 billion bucks is just the cost of doing business mm -hmm. because they have not changed their ways. You know, again, not all drugs are bad. Not all drug companies are out to, you know, only make a buck over particular prescriptions. But this is really drastic and this is killing children and this is putting too many people at risk and putting putting profit over people is a, a pretty good way to summarize it and those aren't my words those are the words of a federal judge who uh, made some statements after nailing Johnson and Johnson for doing this kind of behavior Johnson and Johnson a family company right yeah. well they're they're doing the same thing so, you know, there's something called off-label use. Here's where the criminality comes in. A doctor, it, the FDA will say that a particular drug is okay for, for parent, for um, adults, and not children, right? But a doctor can go ahead and prescribe that to anybody she wants. There's nothing illegal. It happens all the time. Maybe they find out that a certain antidepressant really helps somebody sleep 
and they say, well, this this has worked for a lot of my patients and helps 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 these women who are maybe menopausal or something get better sleep. So why don't you take it? There's nothing illegal about that at all. But what is illegal is for the drug company to advertise and market that it's okay for that what we call off-label use. They can't do that. If a drug is only FDA approved for adults, the drug company can't go up to a doctor and say, hey, you know, this is actually shown to be very effective in teenagers and you should use it as these antidepressants for teenagers. Totally illegal, but that's totally what they're doing because if you, if the drug company can expand their market, I mean, what are the reasons would they do this for? Mm -hmm. They're expanding their market and the sales of the drugs go up exponentially. It's a hard truth to swallow that a company would do this when people's lives and health are at stake, but this is the truth of what's happening. So it's a, a lot of it has to do with this off-label use, and it's happening a lot, and they pay humongous fines for that kind of criminal behavior. But as I said, it doesn't stop them. They're putting profits over people. So it, there's a company called Forest Laboratories that paid a huge multi-million dollar fine for illegally marketing Celexa as an, and you've probably heard of Celexa, as an antidepressant for children and adolescents, but it's only FDA approved for adults. So, you know, the, the, the government takes them to court, they get their fine, and then they just, they're back in business. It happens with many, many different, com uh, different companies. So a little bit about, um, I can give you more details on that later too about some of the stuff that they're doing. But here, here are some of the facts about how many are taking these drugs, how many of these drugs are being sold. According to the National Center for Health S Statistics, which is part of the NIH, um, they, antidepressants are the third most common prescription drug taken by Americans of all ages. That's a lot of people. They are the number one prescription drug taken by people ages 18 to 44. The number one drug. We hear about cholesterol drugs and, you know, all kind of diabetes drugs, some other stuff that we hear in commercials all the time. Oh, and by the way, we are the only country on the planet that allows the advertising of drugs directly to the consumer. Nobody else does that. You know how they all started showing up on TV about 15, 20 years ago? No other country does that. We are all about sales. So one out of 10 Americans age 12 and above, one out of 10 Americans, how many does that make here, age 12 and above, is taking an antidepressant. That's 11% of the population. That's a pretty nice, healthy sales target. <laughs> That's why they're doing so well. Many more women than men take these drugs. About one out of four women aged 40 to 59, that's 23% of those middle-aged women, mm -hmm. are taking antidepressants. One of the more dramatic cases that has come out about the criminal activity that's happening with Big Pharma is out in California, a big state, you know, with a big foster care system, a lot of foster care kids being, uh, being dealt with in the state of California. Well, there was an in investigation done by some, uh, some journalists, investigative journalists, and they found out that one out of every four teenagers in California's foster care system was receiving some kind of psychotropic drug, either an antidepressant or an antipsychotic drug. That's three times the rate of how those drugs are being prescribed to kids nationwide. So three times more kids in that huge state's foster care system were getting these drugs. Obviously, the pharmaceutical companies had found a very convenient, convenient market, and they were taking advantage of it. They were spending a lot of money to get to the doctors who worked in that who work in that foster care system, and convince them to use these drugs as ways to get these kids settled down and make them a little more easy to manage. It's a huge expose 
that was published, and it's all online, and it's it's really interesting. For instance, um, the pharmaceutical company spent more than $14 million from in three years, 2010 to 2013, to woo the California doctors who treat foster, kill, uh, foster children. Overall, drug makers reported payments to 908 doctors, and well over half of those prescribed psych, uh, psychotropic medications to the state's foster children. So they, they took them on trips, they sent them to golf courses, they gave them nice vacations, they gave them beautiful dinners, and they convinced these doctors to prescribe these drugs to the foster kids. The most vulnerable people in the state of California, foster children, and they're being used as uh, commodities uh, for, for selling drugs. It's really hard to think of something more sinister, if you ask me. So I take that, those issues, and I put them into the plot of Fatal Remedy. and. As I said in the beginning, the second main theme here is about something that's happening with psychiatry, and that's been happening for some time, with a you know a certain percentage uh, percentage of psychiatrists. Yeah, there's uh, some of those facts that I mentioned before. Sorry, I didn't have that up. Um, I'll keep that up for a second. Okay, according to the Journal of the American Medical Association. 10% uh, of psychiatrists, 10% of psychiatrists admitted to at least one sexual encounter with a patient. Oh, no. Uh-oh. So we all know it's not ethical. Pretty much we can agree it's not ethical. Again, vulnerability. A person who's in therapy going under analytical treatment or any kind of therapeutic treatment, they're vulnerable. And you don't exploit them in any way, especially sexually. And because this survey depended on self-reporting, many experts believe that that number is very conservative. According to a study by the AMA again, psychiatry and child psychiatry were significantly overrepresented when it came to disciplinary actions. They were, psychiatrists were disciplined at four times the rate of other physicians. Don't know quite why. It is definitely a club of protection. In a survey of about 1,500 psychiatrists, this is pretty interesting. In a survey of about 1,500 psychiatrists, 65% said that they had treated patients who came to them saying that they had been sexually involved with their previous therapists. And 87% of these new, you know, the, the current psychiatrists believe that that was harmful, that wasn't right. But only 8% of them reported that. So they knew that their colleagues were breaking at least the ethical laws, the ethical rules of the profession. But only 8% of them did something about it and reported that fellow colleague, that practitioner. That's why it keeps happening. And not enough is being done. Um, the AMA reports that although the abuse of patients sexually causes immense harm, a substantial portion of physicians disciplined for these offenses are allowed to either continue to practice or return to practice. And in, in one case, this is the psychiatrist that um, I based my antagonist on, he had, at one point, 23 um, <laughs> cases against him, um, 23 counts of disciplinary action against him from women, either patients or the mothers of child patients of him, mm -hmm. for sexual misconduct. Mm -hmm. And what did, the, uh, what, what did his state health board do to punish him for that? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> they, they slapped him on the wrist, and they, sus well, they suspended his license for two weeks. <laughs> and as, as one of, uh, as a psychologist in, who's very, very close to that case told me, he said, basically, they gave him a two-week vacation. <laughs> what? And that was it. So he, he had done a lot of harm, and he's back practicing. And that wasn't the only set of cases against him. 
and he is still a practicing psychiatrist. And this, this isn't ancient history either. This has happened in the last 10 years. So across the country, scores of health board actions or legal suits come up every year against psychiatrists who have sex with their patients, sleep in their homes, violate their confidence, and engage in unethical seduction therapy or other negligent and in some cases, as I said, illegal activity where it's a felony to have sex with a patient. So as, as the medical, um, the principles of medical ethics, which is what the Psychiatric Association goes by, as they say, they explain that the inherent inequality in the doctor-patient relationship may lead to exploitation of the patient. And because of this unequal relationship, in which the patient's Ill illness makes her especially vulnerable, many professionals consider sex with patients to be rape. Sexually exploited psychiatric patients have suffered from serious mental illness, suicide, and other tragic events. So those are just some of the facts that I found absolutely startling and that turned, turned my head around when I was doing uh, research for this novel, because I had so many statements that I read from state health boards. I had so many interviews with people. I had a very interesting um, interview and long-term uh, work relationship with a, a sports psychologist who had, his whole life had been torn apart because he sent his wife to a colleague, to a psych psychiatrist, um, for medication for very mild uh, behavioral stuff because her psychiatrist had retired. And so he sent her to someone that he knew professionally. But that psychiatrist, he didn't know him quite well enough because what happened was this psychiatrist put her on a what they call a cocktail of antidepressants. They mix them up and um, make a very powerful combination that makes the patient even more vulnerable. And this psychiatrist convinced the woman that she was in a bad marriage and she should really get out of it and she should move in with him. <laughs> and this wasn't the first time he had done this. This, this uh, The, the ex-husband found out later on. And so this woman abandoned her two young sons and her husband and took up with this psychiatrist. And the husband who's left behind decided he really wanted to try to do something about this. So he's the one who called up this mutual friend and said, do you know a writer who, who would like to make a novel out of something that I, I think people should know about? And that's how the book came to be. So you'll recognize that character in this, in this story. You'll recognize uh, one of my protagonists is a woman who's an investigator with a health board, and she's kind of a, a wonder woman. She's, she's with the National Guard, and she goes to different countries to treat malaria patients, and she's a martial arts expert and everything. I didn't make any of that up. That's based on an actual woman who was involved in a lot of these investigations. So she was really fun to write about. I, it was kind of an honor to meet her because she was an amazing person. So as I said, about 85, maybe even 90 percent of what happens in this book is based on stuff that I learned is true. And I hope that people who read it are entertained because it's a thriller. I created, you know, I had to, I had to play with the truth in order to make it work as a thriller. Somebody has to get killed and you've got to have suspense and you've got to have a lot of uh, obstacles for your hero and your heroine to, to get through. So hopefully it works in that way. But, um, but the, the message that lies underneath it, I'm afraid, is a very stark truth that the more people begin to know about it, the more we'll be able to speak up and demand that uh, our doctors start to give us other alternatives when we're, when we're feeling down and, and we'd like to do something to turn our, our depression around, or at least have our depression diagnosed in a much more realistic way. So those are the facts that I wanted to tell you about to just give you a little idea of what went into writing this book that, and that even though it's fiction, it is definitely based on a lot of fact. So there you go. I'm happy to answer any kind of questions. I, I
can't guarantee that I'm going to know the answer, but I'll give everything a shot. Right. Real quick, um, yes. tell us a little bit about your other books, a little bit about your background, and how you account for the writing process, just very briefly. Okay. Uh, well, I um, I was born in Minneapolis, and I went to school to study music, actually. My husband and I moved to New York City to pursue our singing careers. We're classical singers, and we kind of, we sold everything we had, and we packed everything up in a little car and moved to Manhattan and, you know, went after our dream. And we looked for job. Everybody has to get a day job when you move to New York. So I happened to get a job in publishing. And I was a secretary, and then I was a copywriter writing advertisements about books, and it was really fun. And it got me in the middle of the publishing industry. And before I knew it, I had talked myself into, uh, with an agent, getting my first book deal. And it was a biography of a singer that happened to just work out really well. And that was back in about 1994. And ever since then, one book has led to another and another. Until now, I have 17 books published. And a few more where I'm the, uh, the editor or the collaborator, and I'm not listed as the writer. But I've been really busy ever since then. So life is full of, full of surprises. You never know what's down the road. And when's your next book, and what's it going to be about? You know, my next piece of writing is not going to be a book, it's going to be a play. And um, as, as I said, my background is with music. I'm writing a play about the famous opera singer Maria Callas. And it's a one woman, one act play with some famous arias in it that she's famous for. And we're going to be producing it in Minneapolis this fall and I'm really excited about that. So I've been wanting to write a play for a long, long time and it's, it's really fun to put all my music background into it. Is that good? Is that, yes, does that answer that's everything? Okay. <laughs> Thanks Thank a lot. Yes, sir. Well, if we have freedom of speech in this country, I haven't studied the law. Why can't you tell the truth about someone? And if it's the truth, why would you have to be afraid of this libel thing? Because the truth is, if it's real, the public should know about this. Yeah, you know, I think you're right. The, the guy that came to me, this, this psychologist guy whose wife had been taken away, he was real sensitive about that, and he didn't want to put himself in that position because he worked in that same community where this guy was still practicing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if it's a big city, I'm not going to tell you where, where it actually took place. But those professional fields tend to be kind of small. <laughs> All of our professions is, are a small world, right? So it was really him being sensitive. And I suggested, I said, well, you know, we could write a true crime book. You know, that, that genre, true crime, that might be pretty cool. But he was, he was hesitant to do that. But it's public record. When a doctor has been disciplined, it's public record. You go to the, the website of that state health board, and you can see the disciplinary actions and everything. So there would be nothing libelous about saying that he did this, 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 and this. Uh, I'm wondering um, if the profession of psychiatry, do you know if there's a higher percentage of um, sociopaths or uh, than I do that feel? You, you talk about vulnerability of patients and being. I, I can't speak to, I can't answer that, but there was, there was one tidbit about psychiatry that may speak to it a little bit, uh, where, again, the AMA had reported, reported this. Um, Although the abuse of patients sexually causes immense harm, a substantial portion of physicians disciplined for these offenses are allowed to either continue or practice a seat. Oh, here it is, here it is, I'm sorry. 90%, this is according to the American Journal of Psychiatry, the experts, right? 90% of psychiatrists who sexually exploit and abuse their patients have a great difficulty recognizing that they have injured their patients. So when you say sociopaths, are they sociopaths? Yeah. Maybe you're intuitively onto something there. Because if they, if 90% of them, that's all of them that are doing this, don't realize that they're actually doing harm, there's something off about their boundaries at least, right? So I cannot 
answer that question with real, you know, conviction or anything, but this is a fact. So, good question. Liliana? Okay, um, uh, Miss Antonia, I'm actually, I'm, thank you so much. Hi, Liliana. Thank you. Um, I will try to speak English, but it's my third language. So please try to understand, okay? I will speak slowly. So actually, I'm in holistic medicine, and I have certificate Reiki practitioner uh, level two, okay? So I'm pretty much related to what you said, and I'm appreciated. So my question is, according to your writing, and your like advocate, and uh, uh, try to open eyes about this pharmaceutical stuff, What's going on? So my question is, if you from Minneapolis, if it's, I'm wondering if it was any movement or lobbying in maybe Minneapolis uh, local government or um, around, around the people, maybe even holistic medicine, even musician. I'm musician too. I'm musician, I play piano. So my question is, any campaign wars or lobbying against those, the criminal, what they're doing? It, it's not right, so any campaign or lobbying against them, uh, what they do not right? Thank not you. that I'm aware of. I haven't, I haven't heard of any, but I haven't researched it either. But I certainly haven't seen it coming up in the, in the newspaper or anything recently. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, uh, since uh, Colonel Congress was a patient or a client or a penitent is a criminal offense in most states, a felony, uh, did uh, the uh, psychologist that you were talking about take any criminal action against this uh, psychiatrist who had in fact done more than simply seduced his uh, wife? He damaged her significantly. He did. He sued him and he won. No, and he he filed criminal charges. He filed, it was a civil suit of some kind. I don't know uh, what, what exactly those charges entailed. I don't remember specifically, but I know that he was, um, that, he, that he won a, f a fiscal settlement against that psychiatrist. And did that psychiatrist lose his license as a result of this? No, not at all. You're kidding. No. Doug Bush here. Yeah, I, I, I want to ask the author, or presenter, have you ever been treated for mental illness or had someone been treated for mental illness? And also, for that matter, if you've known children that have been treated for mental illness that benefited from the treatment. Because you're bell you're bell uh, the whole, you make it sound like it, the minute you see a psychiatrist, it's terrible, it's, you know, it's the worst thing that could happen to you, and you're never going to be helped. I'm asking you, do you know of any instances where the person has been helped in your life? Well, at the beginning of this, I made a disclaimer, and I said, I'm not against therapy in general. I'm not against psychiatry in general. I am trying to raise awareness about this particular fact that's happening in psychiatry. It's not every psychiatrist but it is four times as many psychiatrists as other types of medical professionals. So there's something off about that. I believe in therapy. I think, great, I think good therapists are absolutely an, an absolutely essential part of medicine in this country. I really do. And my mother was treated for depression when she was relatively young. And had she followed through with her talk therapy, um, with her psychiatrist, I think she, it would have helped her a lot more than just the shock treatments that she got without much follow, follow through. You know, so it, the, there are a lot of variables here. And I was considering going into um, um, therapy myself, becoming a therapist, because I'm fascinated with psychology and with personal transformation. So that's a big part of my life, and I think it's, it can be extremely, extremely positive. So I'm not bashing anything in general at all, but these facts need to be, um, we need to have more of a conversation about this stuff than we're having. Because if the psychiatrists who are being abusive are getting away with it definitely within their own field because their colleagues aren't reporting it, and the state health boards aren't punishing them adequately, you know, how is that going to change? It's only going to change if, if people care about it. 
So that's why I think it's valuable to talk about it. Johan is my name. Yeah, I was, I actually, I had a similar question to Ileana's. I was wondering if any of the inspiration of this came from the research scandal going on at the University of Minnesota over psychiatric research. There's been a, uh, the, uh, basically the, med the, the drug companies set the research agenda for most of medicine uh, in this country now and in a lot of the world. Um, the more the, more the uh, government bails out of funding the universities, the more dependent they are on this private financing. And um, there's been a, a major research scandal at the University of Minnesota around the suicide of a young man who was in a clinical trial there, um, <coughs> whose mother could see that he was getting worse on the experimental treatment, and she was utterly unable to get him out. Um, and uh, the, it involves the head of the department, I believe, um, a gentleman who's taken in hundreds of thousands of dollars for, his, for performing research of this sort and uh, has a financial interest in making sure that he recruits enough people and they stay in the study. So. Boy, that's really interesting. And I. I have to admit, I don't know about that specific case that's happening right in my own city. Dan Markington is his name? Okay. No, I'm not familiar with oh, it. Okay. Um, but, you know, I finished this a while back and took a while to get it published and yeah. all that. So I'm not up to date from the list of the week. But I, I'm really glad you brought that up because I'm going to go look that up immediately. But the point you bring up is a really, really important one because this is a huge trend now. And it's, it's well established, it's been well reported that, as you say, um, a great deal, a majority of the medical uh, pharmaceutical research going on, the studies, mm -hmm. are being sponsored and paid for by the drug companies themselves. Yeah. They have a vested interest in positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. They have a vested interest in tossing out the studies that show negative outcomes and not showing those to the FDA. And that's the way it works. It's a really crazy system once you learn about how these drugs are approved. Bell insists those results are private property. Exactly. It's intellectual property, private property. It's, re it's really something else. It's kind of rigged against uh, public health. But as you say, this is a, of course, it's a, a conflict of interest that the studies, not only this, and this, the way they're reported in the medical journals, peer-reviewed journals, that's supposed to be what science is all about. They're being written by, um, by people who are hired by the drug companies to make it all sound, sound uh, make the outcomes even sound different than what they actually are. And then they get called on it because someone will say, I don't think that's actually how that data looked, and they'll look at it and and um, actually come out and make a statement that this article misled the readers about how this study actually turned out. This is this is actually a lie in a peer-reviewed medical journal. This is hap this is what happens. Um, so it erodes the trust of the whole community and of the public once the public learns about it, if they learn about it. Really good point. Thank you for, for talking about that. What? Uh, I was just wondering, in the, the course of uh, researching your material for this book, did you run across any information about uh, the use of uh, medical marijuana? No, it wasn't. It just wasn't on my radar because I was sticking to the antidepressant thing. So I'm, I'm afraid that that's not part of the. It's not part of the plot. It's not part of the uh, the research for this. Aris. Uh, I'm uh, uh, sure that. Uh, Many, many people appreciate your sensitivity to the plight of the uh, exploited and abused children and adults by the medical profession, especially psychiatrists and uh, pharmaceuticals. But I'd like to ask you if, uh, if you believe, like I do, that there should be no profit in medical care or pharmaceutical uh, sales or dentistry or anything pertaining to human health, and it should be all under the U.S. Department of Health and have doctors, pharmacists, and all health professionals have a high payment as civil servants. Mm -hmm. You asking my personal opinion? Sounds good. 
Yeah. I agree with you 100%. You know, we can have industry, uh, capitalism, for-profit business. It's very important. Capitalism is a is a really wonderful way to run an economy. But that's when you're, you know, that's for selling furniture. It's for moving freight. It's for building appliances. It's for it's for all kinds of things. But if, in my personal opinion. It's not about health care, yeah. and it's not about drugs, and it's not about education, and it's not about prison systems either. So I agree with you, sir. I think it's wrong. And if that's called socialism, you know, putting taxpayers' money into social programs like health care and stuff, I'm a socialist, and I'm proud of it. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to, uh, my name is Patricia, and uh, there's a free online showing of a film, and the title is called Bought, B-O-U-G-H-T. If you go online for another week, you can see that film for free, and it was uh, created by a, a gentleman called Jeff Hayes, and it's all about um, big pharma, GMOs, and vaccines, and when you're talking about the research, how... Um, how the FDA and the CDC have um, depend on research that is performed by the pharmaceutical industry, the drug whole drug approval process it is paid for their, their drugs that are fast tracked by the pharmaceutical. So you have to wonder what the integrity of of a drug or a vaccine when it's dependent upon studies that that are by the industry you know so there is definitely conflict of interest there are many whistleblowers coming out now who are former Merck employees former CDC scientists who have come out on uh, feeling remorse for their participation in certain studies that have been misinterpreted, that have misinformed the public. What's the question? I, I don't understand the question. No, the question? She's just the bringing comment. to awareness that there's a movie called Bought that's talking all about this. How the, uh, the drug companies are, are funding the research so it's really, there isn't any protection. Everybody's kind of in bed together with this. And it's a, it's still online, free online. Free online for, for next week. weekend. Till next weekend. It's called Bot. Thanks for telling us about that. I'm definitely going to look at it. There was a big 60 Minutes expose about the big uh, fines, like the big GlaxoSmith one in 2012. 60 Minutes. If you go to YouTube and go 60 Minutes, Big Pharma, uh, GlaxoSmithKline or something, you'll find that. It's a really important segment that they did. Friday, so All right, I just wanted to find out if you had any, um, with all the scandals going on in baseball and football and the use of uh, performance enhancing drugs, was there any bit of, did you uncover any bit of this type of research in the research for this book? That wasn't on my radar either, I'm afraid. I was just really focusing in on antidepressants. Because when it comes to kids and drugs, the uh, all of the medications for AD, um, attention deficit and all of that, that's another big can of worms. And I didn't even go there. I wanted to just stay focused on some on the antidepressants. And so. as a corollary to the second question, do you think something like this could help the Cubs come out of their door? <laughs> <laughs> no, they just need a good sports psychologist to give them give them some confidence. <laughs> they just need some good talk therapy. ADD. <laughs> yeah, um, given the fact that uh, a lot of HMOs and a lot of doctors are in HMOs today, and some of the less reputable ones have been known to push doctors to see as many patients as possible, even if it's only a five minute visit. Mm -hmm. And of course, drug companies have been known, their detailed man goes in there and tells the doctor, you can use this and you can save yourself a lot of time with your uh, depressive patients. How much of that is having an influence on the way psychiatrists practice medicine such as it is today? Everything. Yeah. Everything. Psychiatry, that's where we came up with the phrase the 50 minute hour. Psychiatry was talk therapy. 50 minutes of talking and that that's what it was all about. It was a personal transformation type of thing. Now, it's all about maybe a 10 to 15 minute tops medication update appointment. You can see four patients 
in that same time frame, you're going to make four times as much money because now psychiatry has turned into um, in, turned into a field that's all about pharma, pharmacology. And there's some real good doctors writing about this and protesting against this and saying we need to bring psychiatry back to be uh, to be what it used to be and try to make it uh, more effective instead of just something about about writing out prescriptions. So this is a big controversy, but the whole field, as you say, of psychiatry has really been turned upside down where it's not about those lengthy personal sessions anymore. It's about coming in and saying if, how much dry mouth you have and uh, you know what kind of dysfunctions might be going on about your medication and see if you can have it tweaked a little bit or maybe you should start on something else. You, know, you mentioned a 2% efficacy rate. Was that for SSRIs or for all antidepressants? And I would imagine there's a range of efficacies for different types of antidepressants. What is the range uh, that you've been able to... It's for SSRIs specifically. Those are the serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is the most popular and widely used class of the drugs. And there's a difference between um, statistical significance and clinical significance. Statistic, the statistical significance of, a, of an SSRI, of being, of, of helping, or of be, it's the statistical significance of its effect over the placebo effect. That's how everything is defined with drugs. It's how does it compare to a placebo? They don't have to prove. Right. A study does not have to prove right. that a drug work makes 30% of the patients feel better. Right. It only has to prove that it works 3% better than a placebo. Oh. Isn't that wild? Oh. Did you know that? <laughs> no. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Oh. So. For FDA approval? For FDA approval. <coughs> and they can pick and choose which studies they submit to the FDA for that approval. And if they're, if they're funding the studies in the first place, <laughs> it's easy pickings. Okay. So, great question. Uh, followed by Charles. <coughs> well, what, what do you, do you have any insight on what you think would be the cause of depression? Why, why do people get depressed? You know, this is, uh, I'm so glad you asked that because there are a lot, as I say, a lot of physicians and, and researchers out there in the medical, um, in, our, in our medical community trying to figure that out in earnest. And of course, what's popular today? What is one of the, the big controversies today that um, whistleblowers about um, in, in the medical field, well, not necessarily whistleblowers, but cutting edge research now, a big part of it, in healthcare is about wheat. Somebody mentioned GMOs about here a little while ago. The wheat that we ingest today is not our grandparents' wheat. The wheat that we're eating is a chemical compound that has been genetically modified and our bodies cannot adjust, have not been adjusting to it very well. A lot of studies have been coming out. Uh, one, of the, one of the most popular books for the general public was called Wheat Belly. I don't know if you've heard of that one. Uh, where these, this doctor is talking about the repercussions of, um, of this genetically modified wheat that is in all of our bread, all of our flour, all, anything that's made with, with flour, with wheat. Um, it causes inflammation. This is proven now. It causes inflammation. What is the foundation of all all disease because it wrecks the immune system, it's inflammation. And so people who go off of wheat, who go you know, gluten-free, whatever you want to call it, they get better. Their diabetes goes away. Their heart problems go away. They lose weight. They have uh, all kinds of, this is proven now, but it's not popular. You know, wheat with the bread basket. I live in the Midwest, and you know, it's the bread basket. Uh, wheat is, is a, has been a pretty big crop for Western civilization for a long time. But as I said, the wheat that we eat today is not the wheat that our ancestors ate, that the Native Americans farmed. And yes, our Native Americans were farmers. They weren't hunter-gatherers all the time. Um, the wheat that kind of builds civilization is not the wheat that we're being fed today. That's why Europe has outlawed so much GMO crop, um, so many GMO crops and everything. 
this is a huge, huge life and death issue. This is why we have rampant obesity in this country. I'm going to call on my friend Carol Sue. This also is affected by the fact that our soil is so uh, full of pesticides right now, too. And I, I know and all of us who have traveled realize that in certain parts of the world, we taste things like, say, an apple. It's totally different than an apple that we get here. So it, it's, it leads into that kind of consideration also. Yeah, this is really big. I mean, this doctor who wrote Wheat Belly, he calls wheat, today's wheat, he calls it the perfect chronic poison. Because you eat it over a lifetime, you eat it over a couple of decades, you eat it over the first five years of your life, and you're getting inflammation, you're, also, you're getting leaky gut syndrome, uh, you're getting conditions that are just always going downhill instead of uh, being healthy as you, as you grow up. Yes, Charles? Yeah, I, you know, in lobbying, I don't know how many Republican congressmen Who? have told me that we're overregulated to death. And basically, it seems to me that the federal government, for the most part, does a good bit, I mean, pretty good job at regulating commerce and what have you. But I don't understand it when it comes to things like the Department of Agriculture, at the Department of Health, my fellow federal employees are all misfits and corrupt and incompetent. Why is it the other agencies are doing okay, but when it comes to this subject matter, they don't know one end from another? When it I comes, don't understand. When this. it comes to which subject matter? Well, which health, federal health employees? and alternative medicine and. Uh, regulating well you know I think in general I think in general most of us are really uninformed and whose fault is that which pillar where is it written in the Constitution that we're supposed to have a huge vehicle for keeping informed so that we can make good decisions that keep our government and our corporations in check <laughs> it's it's the free press it's a free press and we don't have much of a pre free press left I teach you know, I teach about journalism. We have a crisis in journalism where it's a largely corporate, spon it's, it's based in the hands of, a, of some corporations now. And austerity has reached, of course, into those corp that corporate mindset. And we don't have all the investigative journalism that would be looking into these things and keeping check on the powers that be, whether they're government or the, the corporations, big pharma, any of that. We, we don't have that kind of coverage that we need to have a real democracy. And it's, it's really a um, devastating situation that we're in now. The, the people who really need, uh, the, the most voiceless people in you know, urban areas and stuff, they're not being covered by reporters anymore because those reporters have gotten laid off. So this is a big thing. I think it's basically a lot of us are uninformed. Whether we work for one of these departments in the federal government or not, uh, thank, thank goodness for whistleblowers from Big Pharma and agriculture and stuff who are daring to speak up at great personal risk to talk about these things. And thank goodness that once in a while a network program like 60 Minutes will decide to talk about one of these issues that, have, that is very critical of, um, of some kind of corporation it takes a lot of guts because they're the ones who are um, who have the most power to fight back so Marsala uh, this is really fun Thank you. I, I love these questions this is really keep it coming uh, the, the wheat belly author and doctor his name is dr. William Davis William he Davis is, doctor and he has a lot of uh, on YouTube, like 30 minutes, it will change. And you'll learn a lot. Yes, very good. Dr. William Davis is the author of Wheat Belly. He's a physician who has a lot of YouTube video talks that have been, that have been uploaded to YouTube, and you'll, you'll learn the crux of, of his message in, on YouTube. Thanks for reminding me of that. Butler. Oh, uh, Gary, excuse me. Uh, yeah, one follow up. On I was intrigued by your background, and as one of the, I guess, comparatively few lovers of classical music in the country, which I got from my dad, um, 
Could you mention who you like, who you and your husband admired as singers? Sorry, and, and maybe your favorite music and uh, that no. kind of thing? <laughs> Unless you didn't want to mention that. Well, you have, a, you have a, a friend, another friend in the room, my friend Carol Sue Reddington from Chicago, is a great pianist and a professor, uh, and a professor of piano. and. We met uh, doing programs together, and uh, she's just a wonderful artist. So you're not alone. You're not even alone here. Uh, my husband and I, um, we really love um, some of the male singers. I think of first uh, Brent Herfel, the wonderful baritone mm. from Wales. And my, my husband's ancestry is all Welsh. <coughs> Felix is actually, that's my married name, and it comes from, it's the Welsh version. There are Felixes all over the place in Wales. We love Bryn Terfel. We love the Russian singer um, Dmitry Horostovsky, another baritone. One of my absolute favorite singers. Oh, he's going to be giving a, 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 a recital and lyric. <coughs> you know, I heard Bryn Terfel at Orchestra Hall once. Wonderful. Yeah. How many languages do you speak? Well, I studied, you know, when you're studying um, opera, you, you do have to study German, Italian, French. German, Italian, French. Yeah, and so I can I can get by. I've done research in Italy. I wrote a book about Andrea Bocelli, and I had to interview his family and stuff. And I, I got by on my on my Italian. So those I guess I paid enough attention in class that I was able to to use some of that. So it's one of the one of the um, uh, the essentials of, of studying operas is really trying to get those languages down. Well, I hope your books are translated into many languages. Oh, thank you. Some of them are. How long does it take you to write a book? Uh, Pat Butler? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, you spoke about, you know, wheat having major problems these days. Are we talking about the white wheat, or are we also talking about the whole wheat and the multi-grains, which more and more people are turning to these days? Whole grain, it's, it's all from the same seed. It's all from the same genetically modified seed that is primarily produced by Monsanto, which has the hugest monopoly on seeds in the world. So, um, unless they've been outlawed, like they have in some countries in Europe. But the, a whole grain, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't been processed as much, but it still comes from a seed that is a, uh, has a, a um, the DNA is DNA in a seed. I mean, the the uh, the basic structure of that has been altered intentionally and chemically, so it is not the pure thing that it was. So Therefore, you know, we're all connected. This is, we're organisms on the planet that create seeds, and then when you mess with that seed, we didn't evolve to respond to that with our digestive systems. And so it just it um, we're we're not built for it, and that's why we're having these these huge, according to you know these doctor these people who've been researching this. So this is truly a case of not by bread alone should man live. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff you can eat besides genetically modified wheat. Yes. Howard <clears throat> Where can we get reliable information about drugs? <clears throat> If uh, the pharmacy companies are distorting the research and the FDA is not uh, uh, going into it, can we rely on sources, say European sources, or is there some journal that would give us accurate information about drugs? Great question. Boy, that is a really good question. I, I wish I had a good answer for you. I have one. Because if, okay, just good, because as I said, in these peer-reviewed medical journals that are talking about the studies, if we can't trust those, and that's the science with a capital S, who can we trust? Um, sir, what, what's, what, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, there's uh, two publications that uh, you can use for that. One is called Worst Pills, Best Pills, and it's published by Public Citizen. And it makes a list of all of the uh, drugs that fit in their little newsletter, and it, it, it describes what happens when you take them, it has a list of drugs that do not take, it says. Oh. And there's another source, and that's the Physician's Desk Reference. Uh, you, can pick, you can get one at the library. They publish it every year or two years. And that, if you read about the drug, they give you the full uh, spectrum of good effects and, more importantly, the side effects. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. 
In relation to, there is no really one source if you want to find out the information about drugs, but I would encourage you to to, to find any doctor that's called a functional medicine doctor, which is about going to what is the, the root of the symptoms, what's the cause of the symptoms. When you're talking about, somebody asked what, what causes depression, uh, I've attended uh, two different, uh, it's called a conference for integrative mental health. And the, the research that's coming out is more and more showing the relation between food and mood. In fact, there's a, an author, her name is Julia Ross, R-O-S-S. -S. She wrote a book about the food-mood connection. That certain foods, if you have an allergy, that you may not have a symptom that you would associate like a, an upset stomach, but it may be presenting to you and causing a symptom with your thyroid or <coughs> causing diabetes that you wouldn't know about. So you need to take responsibility in finding this out. What's the question? I'm making a comment no, about, okay, about now, the question. Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna the other have thing it. is, yeah. wheat is not yet a genetically modified food. It's not a GMO okay. thing. The, the reason why William Davis wrote a wheat belly is because the, the wheat is actually hybridized. It's a dwarf, you know, wheat used to grow really tall, now it's only about this tall. So, but the reason why the gluten that's in wheat, barley, and oats is difficult for us to digest is because it's such a long, long chain of amino acids there is All no right. human being that can break that yeah. down efficiently, which is why it's causing leaky gut. Mm. Okay. Well, I've read, right. I've read that, but I've also read the other, the GMO, in mm. a lot of different things. Oh, yeah, places, GMOs but, is causing yeah. leaky gut, but wheat is not a GMO crop. Okay, yeah. Yeah. real quick, just a reminder to all our patrons that this is the question period. Yeah. We will have rebuttals okay. at 8 o'clock okay. where you can speak your mind. We appreciate the comments, but we want to I'm, keep the questions. I want to just awesome. make a, a quick follow-up on that. There's a great point that you made about mood, the, the new research about the the uh, association between mood and, and, and nutrition. And the original question over here was, um, what are some what are some alternatives to to drugs for depression? And that's why I started to talk about wheat, and I got carried away, and I didn't finish my point. Is that uh, try try uh, changing your diet because as you just said and I'm so glad that you said it there is a an association now um, in a lot of studies showing a different uh, showing how food is affected by diet and that depression can be lifted by uh, by a change in diet it's a really important finding All right, come on man come on Ileana okay, ask quick. your question yeah. and ask it yeah, yeah, quickly very quick. it has to be a okay, question okay 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 i understand <laughs> I don't want to be a no, yeah, that's for okay. me. Just so uh, my problem, question is, back to music, are you familiar with Tchaikovsky, Eugene, and Egan? And if you're familiar, so what's your opinion? I mean, because I'm from different cultures. Tchaikovsky was my first favorite classical composer when I was a girl. What about Eugene and Egan? I love Eugene and Egan. My husband sings those arias on auditions, and I, I absolutely love that opera. It's, Renee Fleming does it beautifully. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I love Tchaikovsky. I love Eugene. Is he a baritone, tenor? What's your voice? My husband's a bass baritone. His wow. name is Stanford Felix, and he's the uh, oh. he founded Minnesota Concert Opera, which is in Minneapolis. Wow. Prince Bremen, right? Yeah, Prince Bremen's aria. The lady behind Pat. <laughs> We're going all over the place. Okay. Not a question. I asked for it. Well, or an answer, but I wanted to say that I recommend a, wor a website called risk.org, R-X-I-S-K.org. We have a rebuttal period, everybody. Yeah. 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 Rebuttal yeah. period. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. See, Charlie has the last yeah, question. I've got a Charlie. real question here. I just heard you, and I don't follow this, <laughs> but I just heard you talk about the evils of wheat, and you went on, but during the week, and I don't really follow this subject, I came across an article that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the wheat or the flour, but it's how it's baked and the chemicals that they throw in so they can bake bread instantaneously instead of over letting it rise naturally. Now what do I do to ascertain the truth it's controversial. in this? You say don't rely on the government, so much just rely just on the internet? 
Some of these guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Charlie. Oh, the internet is kind of a big place, isn't it? Yeah. It's discerning. Wild discerning. I guess you just have to, um, you have to discern your sources. And I have never heard of that one, that it's only about how it's baked. I'm afraid that I, I just can't speak. It'll let it rise. It takes too long to rise. Well, the yeast process, yeah, I, I, just, I just can't speak to that. I haven't heard that one before. All right, and now we have come to that time when you get your rebuttal. This wasn't it. I thought this was the rebuttal. Oh, yeah. 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 One, two, three. Come on, Mike, raise your hand. You mean there are only three rebutters here? Oh, come on, David. David. Explain it. You get up to five minutes. Once you get up to five minutes, and of course, Antonio will have the last word. Okay. All right. So five minutes each, Brom. Five minutes each. What? Five minutes each. That's right. That's what I said. Well, there'll be a lot of people cutting it short. All right. You had your breather. Uh, wrap the wrap the thing around the mic. You just you, it, now is your time to get some dinner and listen and get your final rebuttal. Oh, so I just listen and then I get up and take a break. You'll get you'll get you get the last bit of remarks. Okay. All right. And our first rebuttal. Okay. Now. Now. Okay. In general, I do agree that. Um, the main problem we have with not just psychiatry but medicine is the commodification and the profit mo motive that uh, a system problem in capitalism. Sorry, but it's the whole system that um, uh, this kind of relationship is um, commodifying and putting profit. Uh, you know, in front of uh, human service. And uh, I just came back from Cuba, and they have a wonderful, wonderful free medical training and schools, and, uh, and a great system, and it can be different. Uh, having said that, there are a lot of issues, and I speak firsthand, I mean, um, a psychotherapist, a clinician, that not a psychiatrist, a uh, psychologist, <clears throat> and worked for many, many years with uh, people who suffered from depression and worse. So <clears throat> the first problem is diagnosing depression. Uh, not only diagnosis are political um, disciplines, political decisions that change every four years. Um, but the depression can be uh, different degrees and have different features and usually does not come alone. Usually it is interacting with anxiety or with mania. So that's what we call uh, either a bipolar or depression anxiety. And it's very hard to know which one, <clears throat> which side of it is more dominant. Unfortunately, mental health is very much in its diapers still. Uh, there was a time we, that we didn't have any medication at all. So it's kind of searching in the dark or more so under the lamp post <laughs> which is the serotonin became big because this was under the lamp post but there are millions millions of different chemicals with tiny little dosages 
that running our brain and cause this, I don't know, balance or uh, regular functioning. And all they found was very, very few. So psychiatry is working on, on people basically as guinea pigs. That's true. See what works. If it doesn't work, they try something else. Meanwhile, a lot of damage. Uh, but the commodification, yes, there is no time uh, today for psychiatrists. Not that there is no time. Uh, they do not want to give the time to talk because they can make much more money if they divide one hour, 60 minutes, into 15 minutes for patients for 15 minutes and <coughs> just subscribe medication. Um, there are bad studies, that's true. However, I have to be objective and most of the peer review um, journals um, are written at major medical schools. Now, that's not to say that those medical schools, the NIH, for example, is uh, heavily, heavily financed by some interest groups. So, medical school here can get big grants from the insurance and the drug companies, who knows. Uh, there is also bribing of the psychiatrist. I remember working at the uh, hospital. Um, they come with the suitcases full of goodies. And... Um, called America. <laughs> yes, and then there is also bribing of the clinicians. I remember that I had free in services with full lunch and wine. Good stuff. Um, and we get reports by... Um, those uh, uh, psychiatrists who were hired by drug companies to conduct the research and prove something works. Um, at the same time, there are some there are some reservations as to the generality or the factual basis um, of of our uh, issues. Uh, sexual, the sexual. Um, Sexual intimidation and harassment and abuse. What? You got five, five minutes. minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five five minutes. minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we can't. We can't report it always for different reasons. One is confidentiality. I'm. I'm getting out. And the other one is that. A lot of uh, a lot of them can be fantasies, and you have to really uh, prove when you charge with sexual uh, crime. But um, when they do, they're All right, punished. Time. All right, thank you. All right. All right. All right. All right. Are those are those books for sale, Brom? It's Brom. Ron, are the books for sale? How much? How much are they? Yeah, if you want to buy it quietly. How much are they? $16. What is the capital of George? That's an auction. That's an auction. The capital of Georgia. All right, if you want to buy one. No fair. Uh, we'll do it this way, as my predecessor advised. Don't take my time by taking this uh, microphone away. I'm not taking your time. I haven't even started yet. Okay, now. Go, um, hurry up. I'm going to deal with a few subjects. The first of all, uh, it was mentioned that capitalism is great. Capitalism depends only upon Tim Bolger. Nothing else. We love Tim. We love Tim. We love Tim. We love Tim. Now, the, the, the second thing I want to talk about is the uh, pharmaceutical industry's ad direct advertising to the consumers. Uh, in order to make their appeal to the uh, Food and Drug Administration, they have to go through tests, through trials, and they enlist unsuspecting people in their trials. Usually they obtain consent, sometimes they don't. But uh, they do not report to the FDA all of the negative uh, events that occur from the trial. They report only the good 
stuff that they think, which may be the 2%. But um, if you listen to the advertisements that they have on television, while they're displaying on television some uh, in, uh, attractive or uh, engrossing subject, they're telling you what's going on. Lymphoma is, is a side effect, death, and other things. So you have to be very careful about that. Um, the third thing I want to say is that although I am a doctor, I am not a medical doctor, but I can make a prescription, and my prescription is revolution. Yeah! Yeah! What kind of revolution? Spell it out! Uh, Hey, you should be counting his uh -oh, time. Doug, he hasn't he's spoken yet. He's going to bite your head off, Doug. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> reset it. Yeah. yeah, let's reset it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now you can do it. <laughs> Are you finished? Not yet. Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there are a number of things I want to say here, and I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, what I like about drugs are the ones that are advertised on television when they say this drug will be good for depression, or that drug will be good for lymphoma, or whatever. And then they tell you that... And then they tell you that... Yeah. That uh, if yes, you sir. start getting thoughts yeah. of suicide, yeah. or of committing mass murders, <laughs> or of uh, uh, things like that, to discontinue the use immediately, uh, I would not want to take a drug that I anticipate something like that possibly happening. So that would be really out of the question for me altogether. Uh, in the Bible, it says that God said, I give you the uh, fruit of the tree, it shall be as meat to you, and the herb of the field shall be as medicine. That is a very good argument that in lieu of all of these drugs that uh, uh, they're foisting on the public, we probably, half of them, uh, uh, a certain amount of smoking marijuana would probably do a better job. <laughs> However, the government, the government won't uh, allow the marijuana because that they have a real good racket. These companies that produce the pharmaceuticals the government can make them pay so many million in fines every so often, and the government makes all that money. They don't really fine them for any other reason but to get the money. They also fine uh, manufacturing companies and computer companies and so forth because it's a gimmick for the government to get money. Uh, it's kind of like the guy that owns a business, say a restaurant or something, and you know, when he goes to his place, there's no place to park. So he parks in an illegal place, and a cop gives him a $25 or a $40 ticket. One day the guy parks, and he waits for the policeman. He says, hey, pal, if you don't write the ticket to me, just stop in at my place of business. I'll give you a $20 bill. So the cop does that, and he gets the 20, and the guy does his business. It's the same kind of collusion between the government and these big industries for the government to make money. So the government lets them go on doing what they do, even though much of it is unethical and wrong. The government doesn't care as long as they get their rake off. Uh, so the government fines are really a racket. As I said, pot would probably uh, be the better thing. The, uh, but the government does not legalize it because it would bite into their racket. 
Uh, my <coughs> grandmother used to say that all psychiatrists need to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> uh, you know, our speaker tonight, while I thought she said a lot of good things, she said that um, capitalism is for moving freight uh, and that, that it's not, uh, it ought not be applied to the, to the health care industry. Well, uh, pharmaceuticals, for all practical purpose, are freight when they're being shipped. Uh, on either by rail or by air or by ship. Uh, however, I disagree with our speaker when she says that capitalism should not apply to the healthcare industry. You have only to look to Canada and see how bad their healthcare deal is, and that's in uh, they have socialized medicine. People die while waiting to be able to get a heart transplant or to get a kidney transplant or something. They die while they're waiting. Here, it's just a matter of money. Uh, that's about all I have to say, and thank you very much. Hello, my name is Gary Levitt, and I'm glad to come to attend a uh, talk at the college after some absence. You know, I'm doing something that's one of the biggest fears that people have, and that is fear of public speaking. That's a pretty sad thing. You know, I have the suspicion that we thought of the Ten Commandments, and we could have thought of uh, thou shalt agree to disagree about controversial issues, but we didn't think of that, because you can get in big trouble. Like, I can name names and places about the mistreatment I've had in this society because of my mental problems. But, you know, I don't want to get sued. So I wish I could say I was here just for, just interested in the subject, and not because of my personal experience. They say that the, the, a world's record, I think, in the Guinness Book of World Records for public speaking, I think President Kennedy had a speech where he said maybe, was it over 300 words a minute or something like that? I'm trying to remember. And uh, there was this guy at the commercials, John Muschita, for some kind of delivery service, and he talked very fast, he very talked very fast, we are not old enough to know anything. And they say that today in debates, they try to talk as fast as they can, which with my 64-year-old brain might be a little hard to, to, to hear what they're saying. But um, I've been given different diagnoses over the years, schizophrenic, obsessive-compulsive, bipolar, anxiety disorder, Asperger syndrome, which could explain why I've said the wrong things or done the wrong things, but not getting any harm. But I would tend to get angry in response if people criticize me, or even sarcastic. I once said to a woman, you're as disturbed as you are beautiful. But you really, that, was, that was not constructive criticism. I got attracted to someone in a public place, and I learned don't get too attracted to someone if you don't know them. <laughs> Even if the person studied psychology and they knew what Asperger's syndrome was, it doesn't mean they would necessarily be understanding. And they say mental illness is like any other illness. Well, why don't we get regular mental examinations when we're growing up? I could have used help in grade school. Instead, I got punished. Once at James Denson, I had to write, I will not do whatever it was many times. I don't know, recall what I did wrong. And the principal had me in his office holding me by my shirt collar against the wall. Again, I don't remember what I did wrong. But I told my dad, who was 6'5 and a half and 250 or so, about that he could have whipped the guy's ass. <laughs> but uh, talking about drugs, there is, do you know there's a column in the trip by Joe and Teresa Graydon, G-R-A-E-D-O-N, who are pharmacists. They've written books. I'm on the email list, and I just started using my laptop. Boy, am I retarded that, as far as computers. I get emails from Dr. Andrew Weil and Dr. Kenneth Cooper. He recommends jogging, of course, Dr. Cooper talked about aerobics, but Michael Mosley is a doctor from England who is a journalist, and he wrote a book called Fast Exercise, where you do intense exercise, and you don't have to do it very long. Also, the fast diet, where you take a couple days a week and have less than you normally eat, like five or 600 calories, maybe one day on Thursday, regardless of what you eat, you might be healthier. So nutrition is a very controversial subject. I have books in the library now about <coughs> recommending that you eat milk, meat, and eggs. And another book that says you should not eat milk, meat, and eggs. <laughs> because the protein, it might be casein or something like that, and milk, meat, and eggs, I think, has something to do with something called prostate cancer. But the, probably the last people who would say this would be the milk industry. 
Just like the first people who said maybe smoking isn't good for us were not the tobacco companies. It would be nice if they, you know, notwithstanding people don't like experimentation on animals, if they said, well, uh, we're going to bring out this product called smoking, but the monkeys that we've got to like smoking, they get some lung problems. And the mice are inhaling it, and when it's in the air, they, get, they start coughing. And, you know, that's, maybe we should think twice about it. But they didn't do that. You think people who sell something would test it before they put it on the market. But of course, it's hard to test drugs on people because we don't live in laboratories. We don't you, have a shorter lifespan as mice. And so, what else? What else? What else? Yeah, I used to fantasize public speaking. It was a way for me to not feel my life was so unimportant. But I haven't done that for a while because just fantasizing about saying the same thing over and over again really wasn't doing anything. But again, I, I'm not sure about this public exposure. I'm not talking about anything quite as controversial as religion, which you know is heck to. But um, so what else? What else? What else? I really didn't practice on saying anything. I didn't. I know this was not going to be a, a rebuttal. There is a book called Against Therapy by Jeffrey Masson, and I'm not really thinking he knows the exact answer. He thinks people with mental problems should help each other in groups. Yes, there are mistakes that if you get in the clutches of the wrong therapist, but there can be expertise about the mind. There's this interesting theories. There's this interesting theories on TV about I think it's called brain games. They put people in situations and see how the mind works. Maybe the last frontier is understanding ourselves. Mm -hmm. Seems like it's easier to get close to the moon than to get close to each other. Liberals, conservatives, men and women, you know, black and white, that kind of thing. Okay, I'll stop. All right. Brother. <laughs> Next. All right, all right. Gary did a doggone good job, brother. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. Gary acknowledged he was nervous and first time up here in years, so we appreciate you, Gary. Keep coming back, man. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go line by line what I heard from the, uh, the speaker and just my thoughts you know, as I heard the great speaker uh, sharing her stories. Um, not, we, we, she mentioned about naivety. Um, I think the doctors are naive that we trust them 99%. The doctors are the ones we put our trust in. The pharmacies talk to the doctors. That's who's naive, not us, we the people. The doctors. Don't put it on us, please. It's the doctors who are naive or corrupt, one of the two. All right, All right. state health boards. Very interesting to, uh, co uh, uh, comment. For all disciplinary actions, state health boards are online. I didn't know that. So if you want to look up your doctor or doctress, however you want to call them, they're online. So is it for all? Is it all? You know, medical, psychiatric? Is it all? Okay, good, good, good. All right. The other thing is, I just hope everybody in this room takes responsibility for themselves. Parental responsibility is the number one thing. When you have kids, you don't want the kid to smoke a cigarette. You don't want the kid to drink a beer. You don't want the kid to pop a pill. You don't want the kid to pop a pill. Let me back up there. So why are we having kids popping pills? The kid needs a, you know what? The kid needs a good scare. And however you scare your kid, that's up to you. We need to fear something. That's what the kids need. Parental accountability and fear in our kids. We don't need pills, baby. We don't need pills at all. All right. And uh, no, GMOs. GMOs it is accountability and discipline. Not GMOs. Eh, sorry, let me, let me skip that. Gluten-free. I don't know. I heard a lot of comments on the crowd about that. Lack of responsibility and accountability. Oh, that's all I've been hearing tonight is... Lack of responsibility and accountability. Please, 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 before you pop pills, look it up. Whether it's going to be Europe, whether it's going to be China, Russia, whatever it is, don't be popping these pills without the knowledge. And it's funny, and we're all laughing every time we listen to a commercial, we hear, this pill will cure the black hat thing. But you're going to have diarrhea, you're going to have uh, arm, left arm sore, right arm sore, left arm, left leg thing, and you could possibly die. So why in the heck would you take that pill? I, they tell us that on the, on the commercials. So we still want to take that, don't we? Or do we not want to take that? But they're telling us that, though, bro. 
They're telling us it's going to do that to us. It's because of the lawyers. Okay, so I just want to share that. I just want to share that. And it could happen. That's what they're saying. Uh, he's talking about w Willen Davis, the wheat guy on YouTube. Is it Willen, Willen Davis? William. William. William Davis. Okay, I'm going I'm to look that guy up. And then early parental discipline is the issue. I don't know. Is, is anybody parent? Are there any parents in a room? Do we have any parents in a room? You know, when your kid is little, you tell your kid no. <laughs> That's right. That's what you do. That's right. And when the kid grows up and you never told the kid no, guess what? The kid doesn't understand no. And the become, kid becomes unruly, and when the kid becomes unruly, you want to give him a pill. No. no. That's what you do. Yes. That's what you do. You give the kid a pill. Because you lack the fundamental basics of raising a kid. Yes, you know, mom and dad. I'm talking about mostly dads. Mostly dads need to get there and take care of business. How about like educated? Just explain. You know, you know. All right. The uh, worst pills, best pills. I love that. Was that the website you gave? Yeah. No, no. no worst, worst pills, best pills. Please. I'm not saying that's a, I've never been there, so let, let's at least go there as a start. Worst pill, best pill. I got 30 seconds. Physicians, that's reference. I'm a non-believer. That's uh, that's something else, sir. That's something else. I wish you would go expound upon that later. And we don't have a. Uh, this other thing is we don't have a la la land, folks. <laughs> we don't live in happiness eternally. We do good. We do bad. Our kids win in soccer. Our kids lose in soccer. When you lose in soccer, you deal with it. And your time is up. You don't pop my pill. Dang it. All right. All right. All right, be happy. Next. Next lucky. Uh, we need another one? Well, don't pay it up. Oh, you can't get that. This is our newspaper guy. Yeah. What newspaper? Inside Publications, uh, the Gazette, and a few overseas papers. What's your name? I have a friend who is a psychiatrist. A couple of years ago, and this is probably why we don't see each other quite as much as we used to, a couple of years ago she called me at a quarter to two in the morning. She was having a midlife crisis and she wanted, to, she wanted me to solve it. I explained to her that I write very good newspaper articles and that she called upon it out of necessity I could probably run a small country, but I cannot run her. And she told me that she was being turned into a drug dealer and didn't know what to do with about it. And she was really frustrated. I mean, this was not a, a moment of high drama uh, before dawn. Uh, she was really frustrated. The HMO that she did some contract work for and the drug companies who supplied her had jammed her into a position where she, as a psychiatrist, was able to give about 10 minutes a day to each patient. Now, you can't even get their, their, their general information in 10 minutes, much less reach any kind of a helpful conclusion. But this is what the establishment was forcing her, uh, you know, a doctor and many others in her profession to do. No wonder people are distrustful of psychiatrists because in many cases psychiatrists don't get a chance to do what they were trained to do. If you gave an emergency room doctor four uh, minutes or five minutes to sew you up and pull out the bullet after you've been stabbed or gunshot, uh, you, you wouldn't get very many people walking out of there in one place. The same is true with something far more complex, the human mind. Yeah. At least two previous speakers here pointed out that we're still in our diapers as far as learning what to do with the human mind, how it functions. We just don't know. But what we do know, there are certain basic things. Number one, you, 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 you don't treat a patient like he or she is going through an assembly line or through a checkout counter in a supermarket. Amen. That, for the little we know about psychiatry, 
that gets you nowhere. And now it is true, even my friend the shrink told me not to be surprised, many of her friends who are shrinks are a little strange. <laughs> and she, she was right. Uh, there was one guy there who every time I said something, out of sheer habit, he always would ask, how do you feel about that? <laughs> they get that way. But they get that way because, I think they get that way, because of a system in which they're forced to operate. You know, we have rights groups for all kinds of groups. We have gay rights. We have American Indian rights. We have everybody else having their rights. I sometimes wonder how soon it is going to be before health professionals start organizing and demanding that they get uh, be given the same respect and the same consideration other professions, uh, including streets and sanitation workers, get. You know, it's customary in some neighborhoods to leave your streets and sanitation workers some kind of a Christmas present. At least they show them that consideration. We force these mental health care workers to do miracles, and, you know, even the great miracle worker, uh, uh, of, you know, the greatest miracle worker of all time, many people believe, took his time with some of his cures. Now, we need, we need to take a good hard look at how we give out mental health care, and we really need to put the emphasis on care. It is not an assembly line. And yes, it is true, many people go into psychiatry because they're looking for answers to their own problems. Uh, this, uh, you know, whatever the reason, as long as it works, as long as they can do the job, as long as they can help people, I don't care if a, a, a pig monkey told them the night before that they should go to medical school. If they get through the classes and if they're fine on their job, they can talk to that pink monkey every night of the week if they like. And uh, that's about all I have to say before I get part of the way. And you left with I'll just be a little a few minutes, Andy, here. I uh, just want to thank our speaker again for a nice presentation. Coming all the way in this, uh, to tell us about um, the pharmaceutical industry, which I have no dispute. I'll be eclectic as usual. I just wanted to take note that on March 21st, we in a sense, maybe revisiting this subject. We're having a speaker on the three building blocks of mental health. And you can find out what those three are. I know, but perhaps you don't. But you can come and find out. Um, we drifted off a little bit into health and nutrition, and we had a college regular for many, many years, uh, Lee Hubble. And Lee Hubble took it upon himself, like Steve does, at the beginning of each meeting to give us a health and nutrition tip. Well, one week he did, and I forget what it was, something like eat raw broccoli or something. And the following week he got up and he retracted his tip of the previous week. He said, don't do that under any circumstances. Um, the one thing about psychiatry, and here's another little commercial here, um, David Ramsey Steele is coming on March 28th, and he's a doctorate in political science, and I see him at various things because he's been publishing, and he's written a number of books, and I asked him, I said, I, how are the sailors doing? And none of his books have actually ever sold more than a handful of copies, <laughs> except for one. He wrote on kind of a lark, he co-authored a book called Five Minute Therapy. <laughs> and it's been selling like you wouldn't believe for 10 years. <laughs> and it's not even a field. You can't study. I mean, he's a smart guy. I think it's a good book, but... Anyhow, uh, regarding the government, we heard some things here. 
uh, the government does not make any sizable income through penalties and fees. I actually came across that. One of the few agencies that pays for itself is like the National Park Service, actually through their park fees. But I've also heard the Coast Guard, I guess through salvage, uh, manages to make money. Uh, and the agency I work for, because we would charge fees for our services. I work for general services. And we operated on a small profit. And uh, we, uh, but this thing about agencies making, believe me, there's an appropriation process in Congress. They're going through it right now. They wouldn't bother with it if all the agencies were making all this money. I assure you that's not the case. But anyhow, thank you very much. Again, I appreciate it. And pick up a book. Okay. All right. Five minutes? Five minutes. When you're ready. Yeah, my name is L.P. Anderson. Everybody calls me Andy. And I'm from the Northwest Information Service in Palatine. Uh, run by my brother and I as a public service, and we translate books. We recognize that people don't have time to read 15 or 20 books a week. So we'll take a handful of books on a subject and basically wheelbarrow full of paper and translate the essence of that into a one-page clip note so somebody can read in five minutes. And that way, the information is presented in a, a format that people can use. Because if you give people 20 books and say, you got five minutes, what's in there? Uh, it's an unusable format. And we specifically I'd like to thank our author tonight uh, for hitting on several key points uh, that I've been talking about uh, for the last eight years on censored news in America. The media won't cover certain kinds of things. I did not know her book existed until I got here tonight. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this is going to be uh, one of my favorite uh, books for the next uh, couple of years because it deals with <clears throat> the medical industrial complex in this country. We're Everybody's, we had questions I like saying, well, you know, why, why, do, why is there such a market for depressive, depressing drugs? Why do people get depressed? Well, I think the, uh, the market for depression drugs has grown since the late 50s or early 60s. It, you, you, it's going up exponentially with the exponential growth in the war on the middle class. The middle class uh, in this country used to have a middle class. You could work a 40-hour week and support yourself. Today, uh, the middle class is being eliminated. So you have people with no jobs. People lose their marriages. They lose their homes. Uh, you have kids growing up being taught by high school teachers and sex education classes in the age of AIDS uh, to be perfectly safe. Don't touch anybody until you're 50 years old or until you get married, whichever comes first. That's being taught out in the Palatine High School uh, in the health classes where in this town where I live. And the teachers, uh, I, you know, in the auditorium, you sit in and hear one of these speakers give a talk like that to young people about uh, how to be safe in the, in the age of AIDS. And the teachers there didn't see anything wrong with that teaching. Uh, psychiatrists and doctors of all stripes have been known for known for over a hundred years that uh, babies uh, raised in orphanages, the, the babies that get more contact and more handling, more contact with you know, loving, caring contact, grow up uh, more well-adjusted and normal than uh, the babies that don't have contact. And it's the same thing with adults. If adults don't have any loving, caring contact, with you, you get all kinds of uh, depression. And uh, the U.S. Army knows this. The U.S. Army is not doing anything about the 26,000 rapes among American female military people because they know that the male military people have no access to women in the Islamic countries. In all other military operations, uh, they would let the guys go into bars on the weekends and have contact with women, but in the Islamic countries, <clears throat> there's no contact for our soldiers. So the army knows that if you don't, if they don't have some kind of female outlet, you're going to start getting all kinds of psychological problems. Right. You know, you, you can spend a whole evening talking about each one of these things. Um, the Ivory Tower, there, uh, are you familiar with a book called Predator Nation by uh, Charles Ferguson? <clears throat> there's a chapter in that book called The Ivory Tower that describes the pay-for-play 
set up in universities. There's about a thousand tenured professors on call to produce reports like the tobacco industry said. They make a report that says secondhand smoke is not harmful. And then that, <clears throat> that, that professor can get up to a quarter million dollars for his hour of testimony before Congress. And then it goes out through the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. This is how the media shapes and molds public opinion. It's a two-pronged process in America. They, they promote the flat earth ignorance 24-7, and they simultaneously run a coordinated blackout on all the scientists that have, you know, they're saying, hey, you know, that's like flat earth ignorance. It's just not, not true. Americans believe things that aren't true because of our media. I, for years, I've been talking about the book called uh, Project Censor, Censor News out of Sonoma State. They teach journalism students how not to get fired and blackballed if you're going to be a journalist in America because there are certain stories that are radioactive. Now, we have journalists that come to this college all the time. They say, I've never had a problem with censorship. Well, you've never worked on a radioactive story that you could get fired for talking about by, by stepping on the toes of Big Pharma or the military industrial complex or any of those. So uh, for those that, those that want to learn, get a copy, log on to Project Censored. It's projectcensored.org. Uh, they have all the archives going back 20 years. They've been talking about stories just like our author uh, talked about tonight. Uh, and a bunch of other things that would m move America forward if we had knowledge of them. I've got cards with website numbers on them. If anybody wants one, uh, come see me after the talk tonight. Thank you. Okay. I'm next. I'm next. Let's see. Jim Bolger. Another talk coming up pretty soon. I uh, hope so, but uh, tonight I'm going to give you guys the instant cure for depression in Chicagoland. And this is the instant cure for depression in Chicagoland. It's very simple. Come around fall, bear down, Chicago Bears. Make every play clear the way to victory. Bear down, Chicago Bears. Put up a fight with the might so fearlessly. You will never forget the way you thrill the nation with your deformation. Bear down, Chicago Bears, and let them know why you're wearing the crown. You're the pride and joy of Illinois. Chicago Bears, bear down! Yay! Okay. All right. I got any more speakers tonight? Or, uh, okay, I guess you get the final word and you've got as much time as necessary. Uh, no problem, just take your time. The only, really, the only contradiction I heard among all of you um, people who I, I admire so much for you getting together to speak your mind and to learn and to, to, to think more about all of the issues and everything. If, if every community had this kind of a an interest and, and camaraderie and, and willingness to to just really discuss things back and forth, we'd be a lot better off. So I, I just gotta tell you, I really admire you a lot. And from what I heard, if I was listening well enough, if I was listening closely enough, the only contradiction, perhaps, and it, uh, that I heard from any of these, these final people was that perhaps some of the uh, reporting, oh, I think she's left, um, the, the psychoanalyst yeah, over here, gone, uh, she yeah. said that um, maybe it's because the patients actually were having fantasies that there was uh, sexual exploitation. Oh. And that's an excellent point because, of course, that is part and parcel of what can happen with Thank severe mental much. illness. But uh, how in the world do we discover that? Who has an incentive to study and to look into that? That's the question. That's the only response I can give to that, is, is who has an incentive to look into that and, and make uh, discriminate against fantasy and reality. But I was really glad that she brought up that point. But that was really the only thing I heard that was um, trying to challenge anything that I said. Other than that, a lot of people were really uh, supporting the, the facts that I brought up and, and some of the ideas that I brought up that I, again, had, had researched. Um, and then just a couple of things about the, gen the last gentleman's, um, not the singer, the last gentleman's <laughs> points, which were so interesting. You know, uh, you made me think when you're talking about contact and how that has 
Of course, even in Psych 101 in college, we learned that the monkey who has access to the towel on the cage, instead of just a, a piece of wood, has something soft and comforting that kind of reminds it of a mother, and that monkey will thrive and the other one will die. Contact, physical contact, we're wired for that. So maybe that explains the placebo effect a little bit, why it's so effective. If somebody gives you a pill, somebody cares about you. Somebody is uh, doing something on your behalf, and that's comforting, and that is some bit of human contact that is positive. Maybe that has a lot to do with the placebo effect and why it is um, a powerful thing in medicine. So I, I really, that just made me think of that point. That's a really, a really good comment that you made. And then also, you're talking about what is depression? I mean, who's defining this for us? And the, the woman who I left, she also said, it seems like there is, she was criticizing how some of these categories of depression have been defined for the industry, for the medical industry. And that's a really important point because the, uh, the diagnostic manual that everybody follows for showing, you know, defining the symptoms of any kind of a um, psychological disorder, they just, I believe, I ha I'm not sure if I have this phrase right, but I think it's right. They just came up with something new called situational depression, <laughs> which reminds me of what you're talking about. We live, we're still, you know, in the Great Recession, if you ask me, I know a lot of people who are still unemployed and having a real hard time. A lot of people who are having a hard time, and we tend to blame ourselves. And, of course, this is a situation that is going to cause a lot of anxiety, a lot of sadness, a lot of loss, a lot of, um, you could call that depression, but it's situational. It's, it's life. It's what's happening to you. It's certainly not a chemical imbalance. It's certainly not from something, um, some other factor happening uh, psychologically to you, it's situational, but they want, they're putting in the, the diagnostic manual that that is an actual t malady that needs to be treated, and of course what's that mean to be treated? It means that you should, you should prescribe drugs to that person. To me, that's, um, that's, that's a profit motive right there. And, it, and there have been, of course, a lot of discussions and, and, and people have been writing about the fact that the people who have the, the board of psychiatrists who have input into that diagnostic manual, some of them are in the pocket of drug companies. And so that's how these things happen. You, you create something called situational depression and you've got another reason for doctors, all kinds of doctors, to prescribe medications. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Otherwise, um, thank you again for having me. It was really fun to do this. Uh, it's, it's really good for me, too, to, to keep myself in check and, and um, keep up to date on some of the things that are happening, even in my, in my own state. So thank you again. It's great to meet you all. And if you'd like to get a book, I'm, I'm happy to sign it for you. So thank you. All right, Gavilis out there.